My name is Stephen Vartabedian, spelled V-A-R-T-A-B-E-D-I-A-N, and I'm a retired justice of the Court of Appeal, 5th District. And I am Rebecca Wiseman, W-I-S-E-M-A-N, a member of the uh, Court of Appeal, 5th District, Associate Justice. Wonderful. And one more, just on my focus, and we are ready to go. Right. We are privileged to be here today as part of the Appellate Court Legacy Project with uh, Justice Stephen Vardabedian, recently retired from the Court of Appeal, 5th Appellate District, and um, Justice Vardabedian is here with us. I am Rebecca Wiseman and have the privilege of asking him some questions to uh, hopefully capture uh, some of the wonderful times that he has spent here at the Court of Appeal as well as on the trial bench. Um, Justice Vardabedian, uh, the 5th District Court of Appeal is located in Fresno, which is in the central San Joaquin Valley. And you have a very interesting and unique family background. Before we get into your judicial ex experiences, why don't you tell us a little bit about your family and your background? Well, first of all, Becky, let me thank you for conducting this interview, and it's my pleasure to be here. I'm on a different side of the interview uh, today, which is uh, quite exciting for me. Uh, yes, um, I am a, a third generation uh, American. Uh, my, my heritage, uh, my father, Armenian, and my mother, Lebanese. Uh, and the, the story of those families, what, what brought them uh, to the United States, I think probably is very similar to many other immigrant stories. I had grandparents coming through Ellis Island and uh, uh, starting on the East Coast and, and eventually migrating to the West Coast. Uh, my, my grandfather came from a region of Armenia called Harpert uh, on my father's side and my, my grandmother similarly. Uh, they both came here before they married and on my mother's side they came from a region called Biskinta which is known as the olive oil capital of the world, believe it or not. So as a child, I got to eat a lot of uh, food with <laughs> olive oil. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, th these were families, I think, that came here uh, with very little education. And I typically point to, to my grandfather, Solomon, as, as the person that I had the most experience with as a child. And my grandfather would, would tell me stories about uh, what brought him to the United States, about his heritage, and uh, he actually came to the United States uh, when he was 18 years old in 1908. And so I'll use him as an example of, of, of the family background. Uh, and I remember him telling me that he worked for United States Steel. He lived in Manchester, New Hampshire, and, and his first job was with United States Steel making 19 cents an hour as a laborer. Um, and uh, I think he initially he came to the United States with the idea he would go back to Armenia uh, the Harpert region was, uh, was part of what is now Eastern Turkey. And uh, unfortunately, he, he was caught up in the Armenian Genocide during those times. And uh, so, you know, three, four years down the road, there was a lot of turmoil in the homeland. Uh, he lost all of his family, mother, father, all siblings, and uh, most close relatives. So he was kind of stuck here. He was kind of orphaned uh, as a young man in his early 20s. And uh, eventually he decided he wanted to become a farmer, learned of Fresno, California. And in the uh, uh, late uh, 1918, 1919, maybe possibly 1920, uh, did come to Fresno and uh, uh, eventually bought some farmland here and started farming. But he, he certainly had a lot of influence on me. But I, I offer him as an example of the heritage. Uh, and uh, my brothers and I spent a lot of time uh, with him when we were young. Uh, maybe this is a good time to go into that, talking about some of my younger days. He and my grandmother used to uh, take first me, because I was the oldest uh, son of Robert and Nancy, uh, and used to uh, take us to a place called California Hot Springs, which uh, is uh, in the uh, Sierra uh, Forest uh, beyond uh, Porterville as you go up into the mountains. And In fact, a funny story is that... Um, his good friends that ran that place were the John Baxter family, who happened to be cousins of Supreme Court Justice Marvin Baxter. 
but he had long family ties with the Baxters, so that was somewhere where he would go uh, and vacation. And when I was about five or six years old, he decided to take me for their weekly vacation there, and, and there I would get these stories about Armenian history. He tried to teach me the Armenian language unsuccessfully, and he would have object lessons. He would, uh, they were part humor, uh, part ethics, uh, part uh, stories about wisdom uh, of uh, this Armenian uh, legendary uh, 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 fictional character named Hoja. And so we'd have, I'd have all these stories about Hoja. I'm sure very other ethnic groups have people like that, but he would, that would be part of his, uh, his, his lesson for the day. But we would go there and we would hike and I would swim. I learned to swim there. My grandfather taught me how to swim when we were there. And, uh, I'll never forget the time I, we were hiking and I fell down the side of the mountain. I think he thought I was dead. He came running down to rescue me and luckily uh, just my pride was bruised, nothing more. Uh, but uh, those are some of the early times I had with, with my grandfather and um, uh, again as an example of family heritage, he was someone uh, who had no education and in fact uh, very much admired people in the law. He had a great admiration for them. Uh, his name was Solomon, so there was kind of a, uh, he, he was looked upon by his friends as kind of the, the wise individual. I remember sitting at his, at his home and people would come and, and, and talk to Solomon about this business problem they're having or this farming issue they might have had with their neighbor. And, and he, would, he would offer advice and, and although he wasn't wealthy by any means, people would come to him for loans. I, I remember uh, now a, a pretty prominent family here in, in Fresno where the, the brothers uh, came to my, uh, my grandfather for a small loan uh, and, uh, and he loaned them some money and, and over the years he uh, became known as Uncle Solly and, uh, and, and they uh, were very fond of him and our families intertwined quite a bit. But uh, this was the kind of man that he was and uh, when I think of my heritage I think of him because he taught me a lot, a lot about uh, my heritage. Well, it sounds like he was a person that really valued education. Absolutely. And you've had an interesting educational background. Before telling us about law school, what is your educational background? What did you do? Well, you know, I think important about my educational background is I had not just this grandfather, but other grandparents, none of whom were educated at all, came to the United States uh, uh, in their teens mostly. Uh, most of my four grandparents, and uh, they very much valued education. So uh, whenever my brothers and I had any achievements in school, uh, uh, my grandfather said, oh, let me see that certificate, let me see this. He, and he would just, just would um, uh, encourage us so much. But it wasn't just in terms of education that I received my grandfather. Neither of my parents went to college. In fact, my mom didn't even graduate from high school. And, and they, for people lacking in education, I think my dad did take a few business classes from City College, uh, but certainly not pursuing a degree. Uh, but their la with their lack of education, to them it was all the more important to emphasize to myself and my two brothers, two younger brothers, uh, the importance of an education. So this was something that uh, was constantly being emphasized in the family, making sure that we studied as we went through our elementary school, junior high school, and high school years, uh, the value of, of, of going to college and possibly getting a higher degree from people that had no experience with that at all. So I was very lucky to have this foundation. In fact, some of our relatives used to say that, that my parents spoiled myself and my brothers because we would get out of doing some chores. <laughs> because, oh, we've got to study, Mom, we're bad, we've got to study. Uh, and it worked pretty well. Uh, so we, we were viewed as being a little spoiled by our parents in that respect. But I, I did uh, graduate from Roosevelt High School here locally in Fresno, uh, went on to uh, Fresno State, the, the local school, uh, and there um, uh, made a lot of friends, including Chuck Puchigian and, and a lot of other people that uh, uh, have been lifelong uh, friends of mine. Uh, I got involved in student government there. That was something I was active in. Uh, I was active in forensics, which ultimately I think had a big impact in me, the public speaking and debate. Um, and uh, from all of those experiences, you know, I, I ended up going to Santa Clara University uh, Law School, and uh, certainly have never regretted that. 
Oh, I can, I can see why not. Uh, what is it that, was there a turning point, something that made you decide to go to law school as opposed to pursuing some other type of professional activity? I think the encouragement I got from grandparents, my, my other grandparent, uh, my uh, grandfather on my uh, uh, mother's side, I always knew him as Jiddi because that's the Arabic word uh, for grandfather. He, uh, although he died when I was about six, um, he thought lawyers and judges were the most important people in the world. I mean, uh, that was something that was so important to him and it was also important to my grandfather. So. I was raised with a great deal of respect for the law and for what lawyers and, and judges do. I think that um, when I got involved in, in public speaking, in forensics, that because debate's the kind of thing that typically leads people uh, into uh, legal careers, that uh, that kind of influenced me as well because I although I was a terrible competitor. Uh, my brother actually ended up excelling and, and that became his area of study. Uh, but I enjoyed doing it even though I never got real, really great results. What do you mean you were a terrible competitor? What's that about? Well, I, I didn't win a whole lot. <laughs> well, <laughs> It seemed like myself and my debate partner ended up on the losing end. I, I think we enjoyed the talking part. We just didn't enjoy doing the research as much and that's what got <laughs> us into trouble. But uh, uh, it's not that I'm not a competitive person because I am. It's just that at that time in my life it wasn't a priority. It was something I did for fun rather than as work. But I did enjoy it and I, I think that was the important thing. And uh, I, I think that probably really cinched it for me that I wanted to become a lawyer because uh, that helped me uh, improve my verbal skills. Well, you mentioned you went to Santa Clara University School of Law. What was your law school experience like? You know, to tell you the truth, when I started law school, I was totally intimidated. I felt like, uh, although Fresno is by no means a small city or Fresno State a small school, uh, the, the class I entered into in 1972 uh, law school had become very competitive and I had classmates from from Yale, Harvard, Dartmouth, uh, a lot of the, the UC's, UCLA uh, uh, and, 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 and Cal. Uh, because of the proximity of Santa Clara to Stanford, a lot of people were Stanford undergrads. In fact, I think that was one of the top feeder schools to Santa Clara Law School. So I was really intimidated. I didn't know if I could cut it. I just didn't know that I would make it. and uh, so. I would say for that first semester, I was working so hard, just grinding it out, making sure that I briefed every case I heard in law school, uh, that we studied, that I, that I attended every minute of class, paid heed to what the professor had to say, um, I took the Socratic method very seriously. Um, uh, I really, and I, it, it, it's not that I disliked it, but I probably worked much harder uh -huh. than I had ever in my life before, so that um, it was really a relief when I saw those first semester grades and I had done okay. Yeah. And of course at the end of the, the year, most of the grades for us at that point, most of the classes were year classes. And it was, I was still, not, still doubting myself and until those grades got posted, in those days we didn't have the computerization, you would actually go and look on the, uh, uh, the professor's door to the professor's office and they'd be posted there with a portion of your social security number manually written what your grade was. And uh, I was so relieved at the end of that first year. But the law school experience, I probably didn't enjoy it much the first year because I was a bit uptight and serious about it. And with, with time, I loosened up. Though. Second year better? Second year was better, yes. I think that's fair to say. Was this your first experience living away from home? You know, actually it wasn't. Um, what, what I did, uh, and my father uh, actually got me my first job. So I, I didn't even have to go hustle my first job. That's how spoiled I was as a kid. Um, he was a manager of a local paint store, which was kind of a hardware store, the, the uh, preceding type of store to the, the Angels and Home De Depot and, and then eventually the, the Lowe's, those kinds of, uh, of stores, uh, standard brand paint company. And, uh, and uh, he lined me up a job, but I couldn't work in his store because there would be nepotism involved there. So uh, I spent my summers, um, and I, I spent some time in high school doing 
stock work, just stocking shelves. But I spent time, I spent some summers in Bakersfield uh, because that was the nearest store at that time to Fresno. Uh, uh, in Bakersfield, I lived away from home uh, during college, uh, uh, during the summers. And then once I went to law school, that helped pay for law school during the summers. Uh, I could make more money doing that than law clerking. So uh, during the summers, I worked at the San Jose store of Standard Brand Paint Company. So those, the, but the Bakersfield experience was my first experience living away from home, uh, being on the job, earning money for my education. Okay. Um, I'm embarrassed I don't know the answer to this question, but you've been married for many years to a wonderful woman, Marilyn Vardabedian. Um When did you and Marilyn meet? Marilyn and I met at Fresno State. Uh, we met at some social gatherings there. She had gone uh, two years uh, to San Joaquin Delta College in Stockton, which was her hometown. And uh, it was uh, 1970 that a whole slew of people uh, from, from that experience, people from Stockton who had gone to San Joaquin Delta, uh, transferred to Fresno State uh, to continue their education. And she was involved in social work was her area of study, and that's where she got her bachelor's degree. But we met at Fresno State, and it just happened to be that I clicked with some of the people from Stockton, and then eventually I met her through, through some various, actually fraternity uh, 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 brothers that I had that were from Stockton. Uh, eventually I did uh, meet uh, Marilyn, and a funny story is that my roommate, Dave Morelli, uh, and Marilyn's roommate, who uh, was Karen Clement at that time, that was Marilyn's roommate, they got married as well. So we had roommates <laughs> marrying each other. Uh, but Dave Morelli was one of my good friends uh, from Stockton. And then, then Karen being uh, the roommate uh, of Marilyn, um, uh, she and Dave ended up getting married as well. So I think that's kind of an interesting story that uh, oh, yeah. we had those uh, uh, lifetime experiences coming from uh, our, our roommate associations. So Marilyn went to law school too. Yes. Um, In a figurative way. Yes, I gave her a degree. Uh, what was it? Uh, <laughs> putting putting hubby through PhD. I guess was the degree. <laughs> I don't mean it to sound sexist or anything, but she she worked very uh, very hard because with her her social work degree uh, uh, during law school she worked for the the Santa Clara County uh, Social Services and uh, and had a very very instrumental part in my education and. Uh, uh, certainly was a very major contributor <laughs> to my law degree. And, and continues to be, yes. She continues to be, very, very true. Very um, true. When you were a student, and let's stick with student for now, did you have any particular professors or mentors that had a lasting impact on you? Well, you know, let, let me start with, with professor. Actually, I had a number of professors. What's, what's really interesting, I have two daughters that went to Santa Clara University and had some of the same professors. Uh, how many years would that be difference? Uh, uh, they had the same professors uh, more than 30 years later. Two uh, daughters that went to law school. Two daughters that went to law school at Santa Clara University and, and another daughter that went to law school out of state. But uh, uh, actually two, two, two instructors that are still there that were very good, Eric Wright, my torts instructor, and Ken Manister, my land use instructor. Uh, and uh, as I say, my daughters had them for instructors as well. They were very instrumental. But the guy that, there, there was a guy that uh, was the associate dean, a guy named George Strong, who would sit there and, and lecture the Socratic method. And in those days, he had a cigarette. He would constantly be smoking, kind of a, I guess the best way, just a kind of a crusty old guy, almost a, kind of a Kingsfield, right out of paper chase type of guy. Uh, and, and he'd really be tough with the Socratic method, but I learned more from that guy. And, and, and he certainly, uh, I got my best grades. He taught diverse subjects. He taught criminal procedure and, and wills, which I had my two highest scores in, so his method must have been very good as much as he seemed to be kind of this cantankerous uh, older gentleman uh, using some, some pretty much old school methods and teaching those classes. But the guy that, that I think impacted me the most, and, and you mentioned how things maybe got eased up a little bit in my second year of law school, uh, uh, coming from a debate background, I was very interested in moot court. And we had uh, moot court competition. and. Um, one of the people that judged our moot court was judge later to become justice, John Racanelli. He was then a Superior Court judge uh, in Santa Clara. And coming from my debate background, I was probably feistier than I should have been uh, in dealing with these esteemed 
uh, moot court judges who were real life judges as well. And uh, so we did our argument and, uh, and fortunately the team I was on quote unquote won if you can say someone wins moot court. Uh, and as always happens during these, these uh, law school moot courts, uh, uh, typically you will have the judges give some critiques and comments. And, and Judge Racanelli made the comment, uh, and I thought, uh-oh, I'm getting in trouble here. He goes, and Vartabedian was very, very feisty. And he goes, which <laughs> will serve you well if you're ever on the other side of the case and you're, you're, you're doing what I'm doing. He said, he said I, I think you're very engaging in argument, and that will serve you well. And, and, and the funny story of it is that uh, I hit it off with him, and, and after that point in time, I did a judicial externship with him. Uh, working on uh, 995 and 1358.5 uh, 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 motions. Um, motions to suppress. Motions to suppress. Uh, evidence, that is. Motions to suppress evidence. And uh, he was the judge that I worked under and, and developed a relationship with him. And, and, and what's so funny, uh, he went from there to the, the Court of Appeal, his first district then, because he did not have a sixth district at that time. Uh, retired, and I think he's now in New York, but uh, uh, I've had just a little bit of contact from one, one time to time, and he's also a subject of the Legacy Project, and an interview was done of uh, Justice Racanelli as well. So I thought it was very interesting how that developed and how career lines uh, tended to uh, cross in some way over the years, but he, he was a very big influence on me. What a small world. Um, okay, any um, law student that's listening to this um, will probably want to know what it was like studying for the bar then. <laughs> Tell us about that. Studying for the bar. Well, you know, I always commend studying for the bar with a friend. In other words, it's, it's sort of like when you get into an exercise program and discipline-wise, it's good to have two people pushing each other a little bit uh, because if you're out there running your five miles all alone or if you're attending a spinning class alone, uh, you know, there's, there's no accountability to someone else. Well, the person to whom I was accountable for studying for the bar was Chuck Buchigian. He and I went back to, uh, to Fresno State. In fact, we knew each other uh, when we were in high school. Uh, and, of course, he eventually went on to serve in the governor's office, to serve in the Assembly Senate, and now is on the 5th uh, District Court of Appeal. You were a colleague uh, at the Court of Appeal for, what, several months? For several months. And I, I neglect to say, he and I practiced law together also for a number of years when we first came out of law school. But the, the point I'm trying to make is and this is the kind of person Chuck is. He figured out a way that we could get our bar review course free because we were going to be the proctors for the bar review course. And it was a BRC course offered by the Josephsons. Uh, who, uh, and, and we went against the grain. The BAR was the big course then. And, and we took the BRC, the, uh, uh, the, the smaller uh, bar review course on the block, so to speak. And um, so he and I proctored the classes, and we, that way we also had the advantage of getting as, as much access to the videotapes as we wanted, and we would study together. So it was an experience where we kind of made it a fun thing, believe it or not, as hard as that may seem. And um, uh, actually, I've got a, I've got a funny story uh, that goes even before our experience taking the, the bar exam. Chuck and I would study during law school as well. And I hope Chuck doesn't mind me saying this, but he didn't take constitutional law very seriously. You know, it came down to it was time for the exam, and uh, I had been taking copious notes during <laughs> class and been paying attention very closely, and, and we were getting ready to study, and you know, he kind of turned to me and said, you know, we had the Gilbert's outlines <laughs> that we went to look at and all this stuff, but I kept a manual outline of it, and you know, I kind of gave him my executive summary of constitutional law, and we bounced it back and forth, and doggone it, he got a better grade in the class than I did <laughs> uh, for all my efforts. And I don't hold it against Chuck at all, don't get me wrong, but uh, I think that's always a funny story to tell that uh, I actually tutored him on con law and he got a better score than I did on our final. Well, it just means you're a good tutor. Well, maybe that's one way I can mm -hmm. take some credit mm -hmm. for that. But the, the, the study for the bar is something you have to go about very arduously. I've had daughters I've talked to about it. and. Um, it's just a matter of, st of sticking your nose to the grindstone, studying a lot of things that you may never actually confront during the exam, but you just have to be so well prepared. Uh, but I encourage people to do something to, 
to make maybe make it a fun activity, and it became a fun activity because I was studying with Chuck. Okay. How did you find out you passed? What were you doing? It in those days the ex exam results. Of course, we didn't have the internet and computers and all that stuff in those days. This is 1975, and. Uh, Typically, you would learn over Thanksgiving weekend. And in fact, um, Marilyn and I were at her aunt and uncle's in Oakland. And I had to go through a process where you would call in and listen to hear if your name was mentioned. They'd go, th they'd go through it, and you you'd wait to see if your name was on the list. And, so and you're, I, you're Vardabedian with a V. And I'm Vardabedian with a V, so they, they tend to listen alphabetically. I'd be stuck on the line, but so telephonically, the, the, the law school would, would put the names on there and the way we would find out. So I actually called on, um, on Thanksgiving Day from uh, her Aunt Blanche's home. And uh, there I heard on the phone, I came out, everybody, I passed. So we, we, we made the party all, more, all the more a Thanksgiving uh, celebration, learning uh, that day after hearing that, my name on the phone message that, that I had passed. All right. You've talked a little bit about your first job. But tell us more about it and, and the type of uh, law that you practiced. Basically, any client that would walk through the door. Uh, what, what Chuck and I decided to do, it, it was during law school. And we had this idea fairly early on, and once we knew we got past the first year, fairly early on that we wanted to open our own law practice. So each of us, uh, took on jobs during the school year with, with law firms in our second and third year. Small firms, two, I think each of the firms we were with were two attorney firms. And, um, and we learned what it was like to have a small practice. Just, and, and these were people that pretty much started their own practices with, without uh, a lot of experience, maybe a little bit of a DA practice, that kind of thing. But they, these lawyers that each of us worked with, different law firms, small, small two-person law firms, encouraged us you guys can go out and do it on your own. In fact, one of them wanted us to be a branch office of that person's San Jose office, but we ended up not doing that. And uh, so we spent our third year of law school very much studying uh, opening one's own law practice, how that would work. What were the pitfalls? What were the benefits? What were the detriments? Uh, and we went ahead and did that within, without any experience as practicing attorneys. We, after we got our bar results, within a very short time, we uh, went ahead and opened our office. And uh, uh, there are two sides to that. I mean, there's some great things that came out of that, but it, it was a tough time. Fortunately, uh, when I, I, I decided, uh, Marilyn and I, I should say, decided we would move back to Fresno awaiting our bar results. And uh, I went ahead and, and worked for a, a, a large local law firm. Uh, and did some research work for them while I was awaiting the bar results. And uh, once I started practice, uh, like I say, anyone that walks in the door becomes your client. They did not do any family law, so I immediately got a lot of family law. Chuck came back to Fresno, worked as a clerk, law clerk for a firm that did a lot of transactional work with real estate uh, people. And uh, because of that, we got some real estate litigation and some of the, the what you might call lower end real estate work in terms of representing landlords and unlawful detainers. So we got that kind of work. So this work really came from people we had worked with. And in addition to that, when you start out on your own, I, I got on the, um, the uh, panel for criminal indigent cases. We got on the bar referral uh, list uh, to have cases referred to us from people that would go to the uh, uh, the local bar association's uh, referral uh, panel, uh, attorney reference panel, and we got a lot of cases that way. And, uh, you know, it was tough for a few months, but we were making a decent living after a few months. But um, uh, the downside was whatever experiences we got uh, were first-time experiences for us, and we didn't have mentors right there in the office. Mm -hmm. So that was something that... Um, we had to uh, make contacts in the local bar, uh, uh, learn to uh, uh, get to know some of the judges better, and they were very kind and decent to us. Believe me, the first time you do any particular procedure, whether, whether it be taking a, uh, a, a family law default, you know, how do I do this practically? Judges were very good in explaining those kinds of things. Um, so that kind of help was very important, but um, 
uh, I think I've described the t kinds of cases that we did and how we arrived at doing them, but uh, uh, that lack of a mentor was something that uh, uh, one of the reasons why I would suggest someone to start working somewhere. Most people say trial experience is another reason to work elsewhere, but just from what I've seen of the experience of my daughters, for example, working in uh, large litigation firms, you don't always get trial practice right away, that the trial practice might come more in public defender or DA type of, type of work. Uh, and, and as it turned out, I did get, uh, put my feet to the fire and I did get quite a bit of trial experience early on, which uh, was just coincidence, it just happened that way. It wasn't planned that way, it just, it just happened that way. And was your practice in the Fresno area? Yes, it was. And was it helpful starting a practice uh, in an area where you grew up? I think it was very helpful. But you know, if we had a rainmaker, it was Chuck. Chuck was the more outgoing. I was the more reserved of the two of us. And I've got to give a lot, a lot of credit to Chuck. He got us a lot of clients. And uh, because of our community contacts, and we had some similar contacts too, uh, being raised in the same Armenian community, uh, many of our contacts were the same. But, but Chuck was the one that brought in the business. I mean, he, Chuck uh, is, is great in his social skills. Obviously, he went on and, uh, and, and held a number of, of, of political offices. Uh, uh, that skill was something that was apparent very early on, and, and he enjoyed uh, that more so than I did. But uh, I think being local boys, so to speak, that, that certainly was very helpful to us. Okay. How long was your practice open? Well, we, we started, uh, we decided we'd start right at the beginning of the year, although we got our bar results and got sworn in uh, in December of 75. We started January the 2nd, right after New Year's of 1976. And, uh, and we were partners from then. Um, and actually, uh, 1981, I, I took a judicial position. Uh, but we continued in the partnership uh, after that a little bit, after I had talked to Chuck about my situation with my part-time judge, judgeship, and we continued actually until uh, I believe early 1983 would be when I finally uh, uh, no longer was able to practice uh, and, and continue my judgeship duties. So but, uh, tell Chuck, us Chuck took it over as a solo uh, uh, practice at that point. Tell us the story <clears throat> of how you first began your judicial career. Well, you know, the kind of practice that Chuck and I had uh, meant that we were taking all the cases that came in the door. And a lot of times that meant going out to what were then justice courts, which were basically municipal courts of small, uh, in, in areas and districts of smaller population, Sanger, Selma, uh, uh, Kalinga, these are some of them that are in, uh, in Fresno County. They were justice courts. Uh, in smaller communities where, where each community felt like, you know, hey, you know, I don't have to go to downtown Fresno when I have a case, I'd just go to my, my local justice court. And I did some practice there. So I knew a little bit about justice courts from practicing in what were essentially municipal courts but in these small, smaller communities. And um, the Sanger Justice Court position opened up because Gene Crum, who had been the judge there for a number of years, uh, was elected to Fresno County Superior Court. And uh, I didn't think of anything of it at first, but uh, what had happened was uh, someone who wanted to apply for the job after the application period had ended complained that, that inadequate notice was given. Uh, the names had been published in the newspaper who had applied, and then all of a sudden uh, it was a situation where they had to reopen the county which did the appointment process, uh, had to reopen it. And there were 12 or 13 names, and I think eventually 20 to 25 people applied for the job. Uh, but while there were those 12 or 13 names and the articles in the newspaper, uh, I'm sitting at home, and uh, actually Marilyn's reading the newspaper, and, and she had heard me talk about uh, how I really enjoyed the judges I had worked with because I had gone to judges to get some help in the mentoring process. Judges were very kind. Uh, Judges that immediately come to mind, Hollis Best, Blaine Pettit, uh, Leonard Myers, they were some of the people that helped mentoring. Those are individuals I had trials before in Superior Court. And I said, boy, you know, I'd really like to become a judge someday. I really like what, what, uh, what, what these people do. And so she's looking at the Sanger article. You know, this is a, an application period that has reopened. She goes, all right, Mr. Big Shot, why don't you go apply for this job? I go, well, it 
It's a justice court. It's not really a judicial job. No, right here it says, you know, it's a 50% uh, time position. You can keep your law practice if it's okay with check. And then you could do this. I said, well, I'll never be appointed among all these people. These people have tons of experience. I had just reached five years of practice at this point. This is 1980. That would be the minimum, right? Yeah. Uh, although they might have had some things about justice courts, they let you slide a little bit. But pretty much, certainly for municipal court, you had to have the minimum five years now. For any judicial position, it's 10 years. But anyway, to really be considered five was the minimum. And uh, these were people with a lot of experience, people who practiced in, in, in Sanger, some of the people who were already judges that were going to be combining a, another partial uh, justice court position with this to make it a full-time, for example, you know, that person could be the judge in Selma and Sanger and make it a, a full-time job, that kind of thing. So uh, I thought it over and basically I was being challenged. <laughs> Look, <laughs> it's up to you. You want to try this out. So I went ahead and applied. Didn't think I would get anywhere with it. And as I say, in those days, these were appointed by the County Board of Supervisors. But first there had to be an evaluation panel. So the evaluation panel for this particular position, Judge Robert Martin, uh, Marvin Baxter and uh, Carmen Yanni and I happen to know all three of them in some way I'm not suggesting that knowing them made any difference in the process I hope there was some merit to it but in any event uh, they this panel would first screen these 20 or 25 applicants and come up with the top three and somehow I edged my way into number three so I definitely wasn't the first choice of the of the screening panel uh, one and two were ahead of me and I was number three so again I thought I really don't have a chance I really don't have a chance but um, the next part of the process was being interviewed uh, during a Board of Supervisors meeting uh, and there were five members of the Board of Supervisors so we went through the interview process with them uh, in something that was open to the public uh, we just stood at the podium they asked questions and each of us each of the three finalists gave their answers and I, I gave my answers I thought I did pretty well but again I thought nothing of it and um, so I just kind of went home um, and um, and I understand I, I, I at that point I didn't know if they're gonna announce the res result right there go back in their supervisors chambers and come back and make a decision or what they would do and it turned out they were gonna defer it to a later day but I didn't even write down the day they were gonna consider it so as I understand it later on, and in fact, it happened to be my birthday, May the 8th, uh, let me think of the year again, May the 8th, 1981, by the time the Board of Supervisors eventually made the decision. I didn't even know they were deciding that day, and evidently, the other candidates packed the chambers with, with, with all of their friends in the legal community. They had all written letters, uh, had their friends write letters of recommendation. They had people lobby the Board of Supervisors. I didn't know this at the time. I didn't do any of it. I just walked away. And in fact, on that day, I had a family law matter in Kern County. And the way I learned I was appointed, I was driving back and on KMJ radio, I learned they had appointed me. But let me, t I think the question, I, I'm sorry, this has been such a long answer to your question. But later on the news, there was the story about how this appointment was made. And it got into the newspaper. So this is stuff I got secondhand. I learned that um, the the board members they actually took the vote out because they want to do everything public here. They didn't want to get into any, any Brown Act problems, so they're taking the vote in public, and they're and they're going back and forth as is reported by the news. I later learned, um, and two members voted for candidate number one, two members voted for candidate number two, and everyone was looking at. Board of Supervisor member number five to ask who he was voting for to break the tie. And he said, you know, I kind of like this Vardabedian guy. His approach was really fresh. You know, he didn't lobby us. He didn't put pressure on us. I didn't do it because I didn't know any better. But <laughs> he said it was really refreshing. So my vote's for Vardabedian. So, okay, the, the board chairman says, well, we, we've got a log jam here. We can't appoint on a two, two, and one vote among three candidates. Someone's going to have to move on this thing. So they went around evidently several times and then eventually, actually the, the supervisor that stood up for me, the guy's name was Harry Huey. I didn't even know the man, but he, he stood up and, you know, uh, was the one that uh, made it possible that, that, that my candidacy would, uh, would go further. And, and in the process, um, three of the others went ahead and said, 
they could go along with Steve Ardabedi. And so by a four to one vote, I ended up uh, being selected. But it, I was selected because of my uh, naivety, maybe. <laughs> I didn't know any better. I didn't lobby. I wasn't anywhere around when they made that decision. Okay. It was meant to be. Um, you then went to the uh, municipal court, is that right? Yes, that's right. I, I continued. Uh, I can eat in my law practice. And by the way, I did check with Chuck, my law partner. I didn't just go, hey, I'm going to apply for a judgeship and, and want to keep my law practice. And, and in our law practice, we figured it out where we had a formula where I would devote 50% of my time to the practice. And in terms of, you know, sharing the profits in, in the law firm, I would take a commensurate amount of profits and Chuck would get a larger sum because he was devoting 100%. So it was a two to one ratio on that. So I continued in that for a while. And, and eventually I was getting a lot of of uh, calls to come and sit in other courts when judges were away. Uh, so it, it kept getting to be more and more and it got to the point where I was doing the Justice Court by early 1983 on a full-time basis. Um, but by, by 1983 we had a new governor and um, the governor was George Duke Majin. And lo and behold his appointment secretary is Marvin Baxter. That's and, a name that you've mentioned so <laughs> and far, I've right? I've mentioned that name a couple of times. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I'm not suggesting for people seeking judgeships that you need to know people in high places, but it, I, I can't deny that it may have helped me. I hope there was some merit to uh, those appointments, but I did apply for Fresno Municipal Court when Governor, I, I believe he, he took office uh, the first part of 1983, it was a 1982 election that he became governor. And uh, by the way, Chuck had worked very hard in his uh, campaign, Duke Majin. He went all the way back to when Duke Majin had run unsuccessfully for Attorney General, successfully for Attorney General, and then successfully for Governor. So I was lucky to have a partner uh, who was very active in Governor Duke Majin's campaign. And so I applied. And, and by September of 83, I was fortunate enough to get the appointment. And, and, and the way that phone call came, but these these phone calls come and this news comes to me in very odd ways because uh, I finished court early in Sanger one day in September, early September was, was when the phone call came and my wife and I had just had our twin daughters uh, not long before that and they were, were still very young and um, I was babysitting them that day. I finished court and I was babysitting and you know just very busy with, with the two of them um, and uh, I get this phone call, and it's the person saying, this is Governor George Duke Majin. And I said, this is some kind of joke. <laughs> I'm here babysitting at home. He goes, no, I, I called your Sanger court, and they told me you were at home, and I was just calling you to tell you you've been, you've been appointed to the Fresno Municipal Court. I said, this is for real, isn't it, Governor Duke Majin? He says, yes, it is. <laughs> Congratulations, Steve. But keep it under your hat. We haven't told anyone yet. Uh, so... Um, you know, Marilyn and I went out and celebrated that night and found a babysitter. <laughs> but uh, uh, so uh, I was actually babysitting uh, or watching the kids. I shouldn't say babysitting. I mean, I'm the father. I should be taking care of my kids uh, uh, because Marilyn and Melanie had something they were doing. Melanie had a school activity and Melanie was with her. And I was lucky enough to uh, get, get, get off a little early for staying in court. And that's when I got the call from Governor Duke Majin, not believing it was actually he who was calling. So how long did you serve on the Fresno Municipal Court? Uh, I started in September of 1983 and continued there until March of 1987. So that was approximately three four, and a half years. Three and a half four, years. Yeah, three and a half years. And, and that was not the end of your judicial career. You were appointed then to the Fresno Superior Court, is that right? That's correct. And, and again, how did that happen? <laughs> I'm, I'm sensing there's a meteoric rise here. Well, you know, after, I, I guess I like to act humble, but maybe I was getting a big head because I got a lot of compliments on my work in municipal court. I was very fortunate. And people said, you, you should apply for superior court. And, and I reached 10 years in uh, December of 1985. Uh, so. By the end of 1986, I went ahead and put an application in for Superior Court. It's, you know, a, a, a bigger challenge, uh, something, and, and in those days, you know, we didn't have the unified trial court, so they, they were separate courts. Um, so I 
just I just was flattered by people saying nice things about me, so I went ahead and put an application in. Uh, Duke Majin was still the governor, and at that time, Mark Baxter was still the appointment secretary, so I figured my chances might not be too bad, so, so I did that. And um, when you were serving on the Justice Court and Municipal Court, what type of assignments did you handle? Well, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm getting too long-winded with these stories, but there, there are just a boatload of stories about, about experiences, especially in the Justice Courts, and maybe I'll, I'll tell just a few of them. But the kind of practice you have is you are a do-all judge. You do everything in the Justice Court, uh, everything from, from traffic court, we were also assigned as juvenile traffic uh, referees out of Superior Court, so we did the juvenile traffic, and <laughs> some very interesting stories from that, probably too long to mention. Uh, did small claims court, uh, would do civil trials, uh, uh, would, uh, you know, up to the jurisdictional limit, which at that time was $25,000. Uh, would do all misdemeanor trials, a lot of DUIs and, and other misdemeanor cases. Uh, and we'd do felony prelims, and we'd even do the murder prelims out in Sanger uh, of, of homicide cases, and we had quite a run, unfortunately, during those years of, of serious homicide cases in, in the Sanger community. Uh, and the district that I was in also included uh, the Pine Flat Reservoir area, so it went up into the recreational area, so I would get things like voting violations, I would get illegal taking of bear cases, <laughs> I would get people who didn't have their fishing licenses, um, just about every imaginable type of case uh, at that level of, of jurisdiction um, seemed to come across my desk. And, and when I say it came across my desk, it was a very cozy environment in Sanger Justice Court because the clerk's office where the fines were being taken was in the courtroom. So people would be coming in paying their fines while I'm doing a, a homicide prelim. Um, <laughs> It, it was a very cozy environment, to say the least, and, and uh, it, it was amazing, you know, the way these things would work. And there would be days when I'd be selecting jurors, and, um, and they wouldn't send in enough people uh, from the, uh, the jury uh, commissioner's office in Fresno. But to give you a little feeling of, of Mayberry, uh, small community court, uh, I turned to my clerk, Phyllis Snell, who was just wonderful, what a wonderful lady she was. And she go, well, gosh, Judge, just tell Brad, who was my uh, bailiff, just have Brad go over to across the street to the grocery store and then to the clothing store, and he can round up some potential jurors for you. So he literally went on the streets of downtown Sanger and, and got me some potential jurors so that we could complete the case. Um, and, and sure enough, that's what we did. <laughs> uh, may not have been scientific in terms of jury pool, but that's, that's the way we would do it on that. And uh, again, this, this close, and by the way, my judicial chambers would be the, the jury deliberation room. So I'd be kicked out of chambers whenever the jury would deliberate. And I, I shared the same restroom with the inmates as they would be brought from Fresno, with the jurors and with all other people that, that would come. So they later expanded the space uh, in Sanger. But at that point, it was um, basically two rooms in a hallway. Uh, that, that constituted the court. So a lot of funny stories. I mean, stories like, again, things you wouldn't see in a, in a larger community. One day I just sentenced a young man um, for uh, driving without a, uh, actually uh, driving with a revoked license. And I gave him the typical lecture, now you're not to drive, is someone here to take you home and all this. And, and you know, I have a courtroom full of people. He goes, yes, Your Honor, I, you know, everything's okay. He walks out of the courtroom, I, you know, I order his fine and his community service and all of that. Then, then, then Phyllis Snell, my clerk, yells out at me. She goes, Judge, Judge, Ralphie just jumped in his car and he's driving away. <laughs> so my bailiff calls the Sanger Police Department. They get right on it and he's back in court. I mean, talk about instant justice. Uh, having just been uh, sentenced on his revoked license, get, jumping into his car. And this storefront courtroom was such that my clerk could see him jump into his car out in the parking lot out front. <laughs> Okay, what about when you're on Superior Court? What kind of assignments did you have there? Well, you know, the, uh, you know, the, my time in Superior Court, to be very honest about it, was much more mundane than the time I had in, in, in the Justice Court and Municipal Court. I, I started out on a general uh, trial assignment. I uh, uh, tried uh, a couple of family law cases. 
I, I tried a number of uh, criminal cases. Um, and really a particular note, I, the one criminal case I'll never forget because I guess the defendant got the win that he was losing. It was a child molestation case. He got the win that he was losing. He decided not to show up for the last day of trial. So <laughs> we ended up trying it in, in, in absentia and I went through all the proper colloquies and, and questions and allowing him time to show up and excusing the jury for a couple days, having his attorney try to catch up with him. But the guy just took leg, leg bail because he thought it leg wasn't bail. going too well. <laughs> uh, and, he was, and he was on bail <laughs> and, and just took off. And I don't know whatever happened uh, to him. Uh, that was one of the experiences I had, had in, in Superior Court in a child molestation case. But um, because I think because of my justice uh, court experience, although I really enjoy civil law and trying civil cases, I did have a, a, a serious personal injury trial that I did do with, with really great attorneys. And I learned more from the attorneys than I think uh, than I should admit. Uh, but the attorneys were Carmignani and, um, and John Cianello. John Cianello was a defense attorney. And... Um, they actually ended up settling the case in chambers um, uh, uh, just before I went to jury. But uh, it, it was a long trial and it was, was really interesting. And it, you know, it uh, involved uh, the privet case and some of the issues dealing with uh, uh, those kinds of injuries that come up in, in where you have the, the kinds of relationships between parties. And I learned a lot from it. But, but primarily after uh, spending some time with on a general trial assignment, I was pegged to become the criminal presiding judge. Again, because of my experience in the municipal court, I was the presiding judge in municipal court and did the homicide block of cases there. And my experience in the Senior Justice Court, I became the criminal presiding judge where I might do 50 or 60 criminal sentencings in one day. So I got my speed up and I apologize to the camera here that if I'm talking too fast, it's maybe because of those days uh, doing that uh, master criminal calendar where I did sentencings, I did criminal motions, uh, I would do some, I do arraignments, we did everything. Uh, if you can imagine that in a large county as Fresno County, you had one judge doing all of those, uh, those, those criminal uh, uh, type of functions that aren't going to the trial court. Um, so uh, that, I, I think I ended up spending nearly two years doing that, and I finished my time in Superior Court there. I, I think I had the more interesting cases, though, probably in Municipal Court right. because of that, that two years of, of, of assignment. Were you popular with the court reporters? They would get on me because I would talk too fast. <laughs> I try to speak clear, maybe from the education I'd have, but when you're a debater, you speak fast because there's a time clock. <laughs> you, you have a timer putting up... Uh, you're down to four minutes, you're down to three minutes, you're down to two minutes, and you just start talking very fast. So the people that might transcribe this interview won't appreciate me because I might be elevating my speed and I'll have to remind myself to slow down. It, it was that, that thing that debaters develop. That it's sort of like the more words you get per minute, uh, the more information you get across to the judges. Yeah. Well, now, this was not the end of your judicial career. How long were you on the Superior Court before you applied to the Court of Appeal? I don't have to think about that. I think I got my, my, my 10 years in, which was the minimum you needed for Superior Court, in December of 1985. I would say by late 1986 I probably applied and I was appointed in, in March of 87. So it was probably more middle of 86 by the time I would have to go through the Gini Commission process. Um, uh, yeah, could I just go back to the Muni Court experience for a sure. while? Sure. And I, I apologize for yeah. this, but as I say, I think I had some some really interesting experiences uh, with some of the preliminary hearings I had. Um, uh, one of the things I did actually, even before I got on municipal court, uh, a a judge was needed in Kings County to try to redo the Booker Hillary preliminary hearing. The reason this was a redo was because the matter had been remanded back from the U.S. Supreme Court because Booker Hillary in the early 1960s, about nine, I think it was 1961, was convicted of rape uh, and the U.S. Supreme Court, here it's 1980, about 1983 I believe, uh, ruling that the, uh, it was done by grand jury indictment, that there was, there was uh, not a diverse enough grand jury panel. So I had to do a preliminary hearing pre-Miranda rules. 
So I thought that was an interesting experience that I wanted to share with people that uh, it's really something when you go back in history and have to try a case dealing with the way law was at some fixed historical point. Um, uh, actually doing a case that I think was 1961, and of course Miranda came after that, actually had to make rulings in that preliminary hearing redo of the grand jury indictment for Booker Hillary in Kings County, applying the law that existed at the time uh, of his indictment. Wow. So that was an interesting experience, I thought. And, 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 and on the, the, the homicide uh, block for prelims, I, I had one of the most intriguing cases. And it was a case that uh, extended from Kings County, excuse me, Kern County to, to Fresno County, the case of Stephen Catlin. Uh, Mr. Catlin was accused of, of poisoning various family members, and the method of the poisoning, as it turned out, was paraquat poisoning. And uh, it was such an interesting case because evidently it was both of his parents, he collected life insurance proceeds for that, and his first two wives. Wife number three was on to him and suspected he was trying to poison her and reported it to the authorities. So we had cases that went several years back where they actually had to redo the autopsies of these four, the, 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 the mom and the dad and the two prior wives. And this was all instigated by wife number three. And, and some of, I think two of the cases might have been in Kern County and, and two of the cases were in Fresno and they got consolidated for a prelim before me. And um, I remember Boyd Stevens, who was the ex medical examiner of San Francisco, was brought in to testify. They brought in all the high guns because it was a difficult case to prove scientifically. And of course, today we get that kind of thing with DNA evidence. But it was just an intriguing case. Larry Jones was the DA who later became a judge and unfortunately passed long before his time, Larry Jones did. But he presented the case, and this is just the prelim. I mean, uh, it went to trial later on. But it was just a fascinating case, the, uh, the situation that it presented. And it was actually made into a movie. Harry Hamlin played Mr. Catlin. I can't say I recall who played the prelim judge. <laughs> <laughs> well, it should have been you. Yeah. But uh, right, I, the, I just offer these because these were the more fascinating experiences I had in the lower court. Uh, those were two cases that I thought were of, of particular interest to me. And, and, and any others way. that come uh, to mind? Well, you know, the, uh, I, I did a case for a guy who's uh, still on death row, Wilbur Jennings, who was known as the Ditch Bank. Uh, murderer. Uh, he would take women who he perceived were prostitutes and take them out. Just awful, awful facts. Would take them out to these uh, ditch bank areas and leave the bodies. And um, I think even years later they determined that he may have killed other people. But I, I did a, a prelim of about five of his victims. I think eventually there may have been more than that. Um, it's four or five. I'm not sure the number. Uh, but. Um, just a very high profile case that, uh, very disturbing, but, but a significant case and one that certainly got my attention. Uh, that was another case, but uh, I think I've talked maybe enough about those okay. experiences. Well, but, okay, but, now uh, let's fast but, forward and get you <laughs> I'm on sorry, the- I'm sorry, I'm the one that took us back. back no, to no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, let's get us on, get you on the Court of Appeal. Get me on the Court of Appeal. Yes, <laughs> and, and tell us how that came about. How did that come about? That's a good question. I'm not so sure I know how that came about. Um, I guess one of the ways it came about is Governor Duke Majin was still governor in 1989. Um, the way it came about was the, the Court of Appeal was uh, in pretty rapid expansion mode from, from during the 80s. Uh, the court size had increased a lot. Uh, you know, from the original three justices to five, then seven, then nine. And then um, uh, it was a point where there were about uh, maybe one new position and two judges retiring during that point in time. Um, and one of the judges was, was Justice Hamlin, who had also served in Supreme Court. Another judge who mentored me, I failed to mention him. Uh, really did. I had trials before ju uh, eventual Justice Hamlin when he was a judge. But uh, ju Justice Hamlin was one of the retirees. Just Justice Wolpert was another. So there were three vacancies at the beginning of 1989. And um, those uh, vacancies were eventually assumed by uh, Nick DiBiaso, myself, and Jim Thaxter. Mm -hmm. And those names will be coming up a little bit later <laughs> in our discussion, mm -hmm. I think. 
uh, just to say how my, my path crosses with so many people. But I, I just applied because I knew there were positions available. There were three positions at about that time available on the Court of Appeal. Um, and maybe my ego got a little bit of hold of me there and thought uh, this would be something nice to do. It, it's viewed as an elevation, and uh, I felt encouraged to do it, so I, I did it. And there was a governor who was familiar with me, so okay. I, I, I put in my application. And I'm going to stop you both right here. Can okay. You that question whenever you're so, was your application successful? By October, uh, actually, I think the word came. It's either late September or October. Actually, it was October, yeah. And uh, September, October, I'm not sure. But the word did come from the governor's office about my nomination. So we would have the, uh, the actual hearing before the uh, Judicial Nominations uh, Committee consisting of the Chief Justice, the presiding justice then Don Franzen of the Court of Appeal, and the Attorney General, who was then John Vandekamp. Okay. <clears throat> well, how did it go? The, my hearing was scheduled, I believe it was for October the 20th. October the 19th was the San Francisco earthquake. <laughs> uh, I may have my dates wrong, but it, my, maybe my hearing was the 19th and the San Francisco earthquake was either the 17th or the 18th of October. But um, luckily we had scheduled it in Fresno, not in San Francisco. But our, Mel, Justice Malcolm Lucas, uh, I think he opened the hearing with saying this has been a, an earth-shaking event, your nomination. <laughs> um, and it proceeded. Uh, luckily we were doing it in Fresno and, and the Supreme Court at that time didn't have a home. Uh, their, uh, their court facility was uh, shut down because of the earthquake. So I wasn't sure it was even going to happen, but uh, Ju Justice Lucas went ahead and, and had it in Fresno as had already been planned because he tended to do that. He would travel to the location uh, to conduct the hearing. And it, it, it went pretty well. Uh, uh, the Attorney General threw me a few curveballs and, and kind of questioned the issue of potential influence I might have had because Chuck Buchigan at that time was the Assistant Appointment Secretary to Marv Baxter. Um, uh, actually, no, he was the Assistant Appointment Secretary to Terry Flanagan at that point. Terry Flanagan was the appointment secretary because Marv Baxter had already taken the Court of Appeal at that point. Justice Baxter was on the Court of Appeal. Which was the 5th District <clears throat> Court of Appeal. Which was the 5th yeah. District Court of Appeal. So, uh, yeah, I, I got a, a few curves about, you know, uh, you think this is right, that you have someone working in the governor's office that was your partner, and is, is this, has this influenced the process? And I dodged around those questions and eventually was confirmed by a 3 0 vote. Yeah. Now, you've served at every conceivable judicial level, starting from ju the uh, Justice Court, Municipal Court, Superior Court, Court of Appeal. I did, did serve one day on assignment to the uh, Supreme <laughs> okay, Court. Okay, everyone. So we'll, we'll just cover that with, uh, with a minimal bit of experience. Everyone. <clears throat> what differences do you see between serving on a trial court bench as opposed to an appellate bench? Well, you know, in the trial court, obviously you're closer to the people. You're dealing with them in a very close way, and you're trying to get your message across. Uh, uh, in a criminal case, you know, that the person needs to change their life if they have uh, done things that have wronged society. Uh, in a family law case, you're trying to, to, to uh, assist the parties because the case doesn't end with uh, the family law litigation, oftentimes there are children and the people are going to have to have contact with each other. So you're, you're dealing very specifically with, with people, you're dealing very specifically with attorneys, uh, you're constantly busy, uh, you're, you're, you're trying one case, you've got a jury out on one case and you're selecting a jury on another. Um, uh, it's not totally devoid of, of academic exercise, but you don't have a whole lot of time to, to do the proper research, perhaps, into your cases when you're dealing with jury instructions on a very quick basis and you want to maybe check the cases that are being cited for a particular instruction to make sure you're getting it right. I mean, you do all that as much as you can. There's a little bit of research attorney assistance, but not much. And then, of course, you have the Court of Appeal, Supreme Court, the appellate courts, 
where you do have some time, you do have some assistance with the research. I, you can go, and I'm old fashioned, I would go, go to the bookshelf and, and pull that case out and read the case uh, that is being cited to you and actually be satisfied with what the attorneys are representing to you in, a, in an appellate case, for example, where maybe you wouldn't have the time to do that on the trial court. Uh, you have less contact with people. Your contact, you know, certainly is with some very fine people, the research attorneys, your, your fellow associate justices, and the presiding justice. Um, but you're, you're certainly very limited in your public contact. So it, it's the difference between having a time to study your case, become a little bit more uh, academically um, specific on getting things right, um, the writing part of it, uh, with the help of the research attorneys, is where you're, you're taking time to get the right word in a particular case to make sure it's not misconstrued. Whereas, you know, when I'd issue opinions in Superior Court, I really didn't have the time to get into that kind of detail. So I would say those differences are between the, the people contact and the amount that one is able to give to academic excellence in an appellate opinion. Was it hard to make the transition? I mean, you had a pretty exciting experience on the trial bench. You know, it, it was pretty easy because um, at first I really liked getting into the, the cases, the, the academic side, talking things out with, because here you're you know, a panel of three people, not just one judge making a decision, being able to talk with other people. Uh, I really enjoyed that for a while, but I have to be honest, I would say I kind of hit, hit a wall of sorts after three or four years and, and saw myself missing what I was doing in the trial court. So those first three or four years, I was just taking great delight in, in being able to dig, dig, dig into cases and, 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 and author opinions. Really excited, hey, putting out a published opinion, that was exciting. I mean, I was really into the job and wasn't thinking about what I was missing, but then I did hit a point in time where I started saying, you know, I really do miss that people contact. Right. Um, any cases at the Court of Appeal that stand out in particular? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> let, let me try to highlight the ones that, that, that uh, stand out. And, and, and you know what? I, I think from the position we have as Court of Appeal justices, sometimes the most significant cases we handle do not end up being our opinions. The case is taken by the Supreme Court. And and to me, some of the most significant cases that I had uh, were just that. I remember remember one case, um, um, Snyder versus Michael Store, and I think that was oh in the mid 1990s, uh, where the the question was whether a um, child who was eventually born but who was injured in utero while the mother was in the workplace, whether that child is limited to the workers' compensation law and the benefits the mother would receive. Because in that particular case, the recovery would be zero for the child. Whether there was tort recovery available to the child, uh, and the only existing case at that time that spoke to that issue in California was Bell versus Macy's. And it went, went the way of saying, yes, the mother was limited to the, 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 the child was limited to the mother's workers' comp benefits, therefore there was no tort recovery available, no, no tort remedy available to the child. And um, Mike Campbell, research attorney, worked that case for me, and I said, Mike, we've got to look at out-of-state cases on this. We've got to find something, because this just doesn't seem right to me. It doesn't seem right, and certainly Mike did an excellent job. We brought in a lot of out-of-state cases. We cited a civil code section, which talks in terms of the rights of an unborn child who eventually is born. Um, and uh, we reversed it against the only case that was out there in California. We reversed that judgment and said that the, the child had a right to a, a tort remedy. And uh, the Supreme Court uh, affirmed our opinion in that case. So that, that case meant a lot to me. My, my name's not on any case anywhere. Mm -hmm. But uh, I thought that was a very significant case. Um, Another significant case, actually, cases that I spent a large series of cases, and these would be the punitive damage cases that were assigned to me. And by the way, I think these cases are assigned 
got assigned to me. And I, I like to always joke when people look at me and say, uh, during a, a certain period of time, uh, Steve Vardabigan had more grants of review than any other judge in the state. Well, it was true. There were some very challenging cases, and I, I relished those cases, and I probably got them because I was fortunate to have uh, very good research attorneys. Uh, and anyway, the, the punitive damage cases started with uh, Romo versus Ford Motor Company, um, uh, in which a trial judge um, granted a motion for a new trial on a $290 million punitive damage award in a case of product defect for a, uh, what the jury found to be a defective Ford Bronco. Uh, early days of the Ford Bronco, where it was essentially uh, uh, a, a, uh, a shell mounted to a pickup truck, and, and they made it into a, uh, an SUV. And it didn't have protection, at least the jury found that, the, the adequate protection in terms of uh, the roof, the roof of the vehicle. Um, and Ford, Ford argument, I mean, Ford obviously argued against the finding of liability, but liability was found, uh, but the judge... Um, did grant a motion for new trial on the punitive damage award on the issue of, of, of jury misconduct. Uh, and uh, for that part of the case, uh, we found juror self-correction, that the jury in fact corrected itself. It's really tough when you get cases, and I had many more cases of juror misconduct, and I just feel really strongly that you have to be very careful before you take a case out of the hands of a jury that's decided a case that has heard all of the evidence. And, and in this case, actually, the judge had, had ruled differently, but many times you have a judge that does not find uh, um, uh, on a motion for new trial that there was jury misconduct. This one, the, the, jury, the judge happened to find, but uh, uh, th that case was very important for that aspect of where, where a jury, where you have evidence that the jurors did self-correct, that any misstatements they made were later corrected before they actually came to their decision. Uh, you can't always get that information because of various things that you cannot get into the record on an issue of dream misconduct, but there was enough here for us to decide that. So we, we affirmed it, but the, uh, another issue, we affirmed that part of it. Another issue in the case, by the way, was the issue of, um, of corporate malice, and where you have a lot of individuals following a corporate policy, can you really pin it down on one person acting maliciously? So uh, I believe we wrote some law on corporate malice that is used by, and attorneys tell me this now, that they use the corporate malice and the juror correction from the case. And, and uh, we're lucky the case didn't get depublished along the way because what happened was, and, and I, I've been told that that $290 million uh, uh, decision that we made going back to the jury verdict and restoring that was at that time the largest punitive damage award uh, ever affirmed by an appellate court in the United States. Uh, something may have come up more recently, maybe not in light of the way the law has gone. But I'm sorry, again, I'm getting very lengthy in my explanation, but the critical issue in that case eventually boiled down to the punitive damage award. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, the primary case at that time was Gore versus BMW. Gore, v versus, Gore versus BMW was a case where, uh, uh, along with another group of cases, the, the U.S. Supreme Court was basically drawing the line, perhaps, to where there might be a due process violation of the rights of a corporate entity that gets large punitive damage awards against it. And uh, that was a case that, that, you know, weighed very heavily on it. But this was a case where two people died. Uh, it was a serious product defect. Uh, the uh, Romo family members were seriously injured in the case. There were... Um, a significant um, uh, uh, general and special damages. I think I think the the uh, uh, ratio was maybe 50, 50 to one from the from the uh, the award of uh, compensatory damage to the punitives, um, and uh, just in looking at Gore versus BMW, where one of the members of the of the U.S. Supreme Court said this was hardly a noticeable flaw in the paint job. Uh, that punitive damages were awarded upon, uh, I said, you know, this case is really different. <laughs> this is not a matter of cosmetics of one's vehicle where punitive damage awards were made against BMW. This is, you know, uh, fairly high on the reprehensibility scale and seriousness scale uh, in terms of the many factors that, that are looked at uh, 
uh, as stated by the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, so we, we passed muster with the California Supreme Court. The California Supreme Court said, fine. They, they did not take the case for review. Four appeals to the U.S. Supreme Court, cert is granted. In the meantime, <laughs> the um, case of State Farm versus Campbell is decided, and the Supreme Court gets a little broader, although State Farm versus Campbell is essentially a bad faith case, not injury. And the Supreme Court starts talking numbers and saying, well, you know, maybe we better, we better have better scrutiny if anything that's double digit. Anything more than 10 to 1 should be scrutinized more. And a whole group of cases from all over the United States went to the U.S. Supreme Court. U.S. Supreme Court sent those cases back and said, reconsider in light of, uh, of uh, State Farm versus Campbell. So we got it back. We did Romo too, and, and we reduced the amount. Uh, but still a substantial punitive damage award. But one thing that struck me, and the reason I mentioned those other elements of the Romo case that I didn't know before this, that when the U.S. Supreme Court grants cert in a case, it does not depublish the state court opinion. The Court of Appeal opinion remained published, whereas if that was a grant of review by the California Supreme Court, it's automatically depublished. It's no longer law. But here, we didn't have that. So elements of Romo continued to, Romo won, continued to be viable, citable propositions, although much of this discussion on punitive damages in Romo 1 uh, got discarded. Uh, the case remained public, was something I learned from that U.S. Yeah. Uh, Supreme Court grant of cert. Very interesting. Um, now, you've had many attorneys appear before you, both at the trial level as well as at the appellate level. In your view, what qualities does a good lawyer possess? Well, I think a good lawyer... Uh, needs to understand the importance of preparation. Um, it's, these kind of jobs are not jobs for people who want to take shortcuts. And if a person has developed good habits, I think habits are very important in terms of, 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 of any lawyer for that matter, but certainly for someone who is, uh, say, a research attorney at the Court of Appeal or even a research attorney in the trial court or a research attorney in the, in the, in the Supreme Court. Obviously, one needs to have great analytical skills. Uh, one has to be uh, an excellent reader of records and, and be able to digest a lot of material. Um, but I, I think it takes an ability to do that, and it takes an ability, in large part, one gets instruction from, uh, if it's a, a research attorney in a court, from uh, the judge with whom the person is working. But I think it also takes the kind of personality of someone who's willing to make a decision on their own so that they can provide to the, the judge or justice um, a sounding board and, and maybe disagree if the judge wants to go one direction so that at least it can be discussed. Obviously the judge or justice is the ultimate decider, but someone who's willing to be an independent thinker I think is important, but at the same time not being so inflexible that you can't say, to understand that after an open discussion of the issue, if this is the way the case is going to go, I'm going to write, it, write a case that way. So I think those are some of the characteristics that are important of a, of a research attorney in particular. Right. I mean, you've done a lot of things at the 5th District, a lot of wonderful things, even outside of the um, many opinions that you've produced. And one of those things is being involved at the ground level with community outreach, writing the circuit. Uh, Tell us what you remember about that. Well, and, and I'm not doing this just to give credit to my interviewer, but Rebecca Wiseman, Becky, you were the one that really got our court started on this, and, and I think this court is greatly indebted to you for what you did. But it was something where we basically had this outreach. It's something that the Supreme Court has certainly become very involved with, but I honestly think that this Fifth District Court was the first one, the Court of Appeal here was the the first court to do an extensive outreach. And I know on one of the occasions that we went back in 1997 or 98, I think it was 98, that we went to Kern County, uh, you and I sat down with the superintendent of schools there. I believe his name was Kelly Blanton. Do I have the name right? I think yes, that's she correct. did. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a superintendent of, of the county schools there. And we developed, I shouldn't say we, but I helped, you and I helped uh, develop uh, a program of, of students in their curriculum, social studies and the like, studying what the Court of Appeal and appellate courts do, um, which is something that I think is very much absent or has been absent from that education curriculum. We brought children into the courtroom 
older students too as, as some of these outreaches went on. Um, for one case, we actually did a video reproduction of the facts of a case for students to watch in the classroom before they came and watched the oral argument. Um, it was a wonderful thing that was opened up, and now it has expanded where I think all of the courts of appeal do it. The Supreme Court is very active in it. Um, uh, it's something I think that here at this court we had a large part in initiating, and, and, it, and it just brings such enjoyment to someone in our position seeing um, young people learning what we're about because in the past there wasn't much known. We were kind of the, especially the Intermediate Court of Appeal, kind of an unknown court to the public. Um, now, sadly, you have retired, sadly from my point of view. Um, why did you choose to, to retire from the Court of Appeal? You know, I think it was part of that thing I was talking about as, as I got three or four years into this job that I really missed having more contact with people. Um, uh, I, I retired at the point that I had 21 years as a Court of Appeal Justice, 29 years total as a judge. I was, I was ready for something different. I happened to reach my minimum retirement age, age 60 this year in June, uh, as was when I retired after my uh, May 8th uh, birthday. Um, I, I just wanted to do something different. I humbly think I have some skills in, in mediation in particular, and that's where I've really targeted uh, my post-appellate court practice as I have retired. So. I, I mean, I'm not so much retiring, but uh, changing uh, my my focus of my my, my legal job. Uh, of well, course, I, tell I, us what you're doing now. Well, I am doing um, alternative dispute resolution with the uh, Fresno firm of Dowling, Aaron, and Keeler. Uh, I happen to be there with two other retired justices, D.B. Osso and Thaxter. You might remember I indicated they were the class of 1989 uh, in terms of when the governor put out phone calls. Uh, to fill three vacancies. I just happened to end up there with them. Uh, they were there before I. And, uh, and I'm doing primarily mediations, but I'm also available for arbitrations and uh, discovery uh, special master uh, work as well as referee work. Uh, but it's the mediation I think that I enjoy the most. And that's where you really have the contact with people and you can, can help them resolve issues short of of what sometimes can be a disastrous trial. Um, how would you describe your style as a mediator? You know, I, I think I am a mix of, of collaborator with, with an evaluator. I, I think the, the thing we're learning in education, mediation education now, is, is the need for more collaboration, uh, empower the parties, allow them to make their decision, and I'm very much in agreement with that. But I think especially when you're a retired judge mediator, at some point that evaluation has to come into play. You don't want it to come across like a hammer. You don't want it to become uh, like you're making a ruling, but you can set parameters for people that will help them resolve case and truly cause the people to feel vested with the ability to decide for themselves. Uh, so I think it's a combination of collaboration with with some evaluation that maybe helps give parties parameters of what might be doable by way of settlement. And you're doing it in a very confidential way when you start doing the caucusing with both sides and, and, and you, you find out the strengths and weaknesses in a confidential way. And you can, you can kind of uh, help direct people to where the case might, might, might settle. It may not be ideal for either party. In fact, you haven't done your job if, it, if either party feels like they've gotten an ideal settlement. But where it's something that the people can live with, uh, maybe not their target, but something that uh, they can live with. And, and you want the people to walk away feeling good about the process. And I felt very fortunate that uh, as much as I feel like, well, gee, I've been hard on these people in this mediation. But at the end, it seems like they're always very cordial. And where I have been able to settle, even where I haven't been able to settle a case, they still seem to be cordial. So. Uh, you, you get enormous feedback and enjoyment from that, but that's, that's my style anyway. Well, so how is business? A little slow at first. Again, I maybe had this big impression of myself that I would just walk out there day one and have people, you know, uh, uh, immediately calling me that they have business. Well, it didn't quite happen that way. I did, actually, the second day I was out, I did have a mediation uh, from a case that uh, 
uh, a judge wasn't available for a settlement conference the parties were ready to go and they called and of course I'd be the only person available and on one day's notice so I did do a, a case early on um, on my my second day on the job uh, but after that it was quite quite a long time because people really don't know you're out and and ethically I was not allowed to do any public relations until I actually had had been retired and no longer was on the state payroll so it was a little slow at first and allowed me to, to get caught up on some things I needed to get caught up on uh, of a non-job non nature. But it certainly has picked up now and, it, and it's, it's gotten busy. I think it's a word of mouth type of business, basically. Oh, yeah. Now, um, you have a wonderfully supportive family. You've mentioned all of them at one time or another while we've been talking. Um, three of your daughters have gone to law school. What are they doing now? And they blame me for it. <laughs> no, not actually. <laughs> uh, what are the three daughters doing? Well, I have one daughter, uh, the oldest, Melanie, who, who went to law school at the University of Utah. was where she ended up going to law school. And she ended up uh, working there. And we were still trying to get her back to California, but she, uh, she graduated from law school in 2004, is, is currently with the um, um, Philadelphia-based uh, firm of Ballard Spar, uh, working in their Salt Lake City office. Uh, doing a lot of uh, land use litigation. Uh, her firm represents a lot of, of land developers in Utah. Uh, she's also done some uh, um, securities law and some uh, intellectual uh, property practice. Uh, but basically a trial attorney. And, I, and, and, and please, please forgive me if I become the proud dad here. But she has been very active in, um, in studies and in bar activities dealing with the role of women in, 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 in the practice of law. And she co-authored a study in that area and presently is the, the president of the Utah State Women's Lawyers. So um, I'm very proud of her for that and, uh, and just want to get her back to California before too long. So that's, that's the oldest daughter, Melanie, who's now 31 as we were doing this interview. Twin daughters who are age 28, uh, Pamela, went to my alma mater uh, law school, Santa Clara Law School, uh, and her twin sister, Stephanie, also did. Uh, so both of them, twin daughters there at the same law school. Uh, Pamela is practicing law. She's doing primarily insurance defense work, specializing in, in um, uh, construction defect uh, litigation cases, uh, working for Bernaysian, Jensen, and Garthy in Oakland. She's living in San Francisco and working for that Oakland uh, law firm. Uh, and uh, both Melanie and Pam, uh, as the lawyers who at time have their struggles, and all lawyers do, we, it happens for all of us, will give me a phone call. And Pamela happened to have been second chair in a two-month, uh, $9 million lawsuit involving uh, 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 a Kaiser Hospital project up in, uh, in Santa Rosa. And it ended up being a hung jury. And the phone call I got, <laughs> this can't be right, Dad. How can this be a hung jury after we put two months into trial? Uh, they eventually settled, which was the right result they should have done before trial, but, but post-mistrial um, post they did settle the case. But I'm constantly getting this dialogue, you know, after the fact dialogue. I'm not in a position to give advice on what, what they're doing because they, some of the stuff they're doing, they know more about it than I do. But uh, just, just um, being able to console them over the phone, over the phone uh, and in, in chats that we might have and, and also encouraging them when things go well and, and patting them on the back. Those are some of the things I, that we do with, with our two that are practicing law. And Maryland does the same thing as well. And then Stephanie is the one that's not practicing law, uh, but she happens to be someone who's very interested in the Internet. And she has really found a good niche for her um, because she works for a firm called Justia.com where she does law office marketing and development of web pages for, for law firms all over the United States. Um, and she's been able to put her law school education to work in that. And... Uh, and there are a number of people with legal educations, lawyers on staff there, and she works with them. So she's in an environment I think that, that she founds uh, uh, very, very good for her. She enjoys that work. And I often joke that of the three that went to law school, she probably has the most job satisfaction. Yeah. Looking back on your career, and if you were talking to a person that was considering going to law school, what would you tell them? Well, you know, I... I encourage my daughters to do that rather than discourage them. And in recent years, I have encouraged people. I know the market has gotten very tough. Jobs have gotten very tough for people going to law school. 
But I, I, I honestly believe in that law school education. I think it's so good. Stephanie's the example. Even though she's not practicing law as a lawyer, that legal education can lead you to a lot of things in fields that are interesting to you, whether it be the internet, if you're someone that's interested in civil engineering, there are legal aspects that, that can be involved in that. So even if there aren't lawyer jobs, I realize the expense is really great, especially, well, it's great even in public schools now. And I think a person should evaluate that expense because I know many people out there nowadays that have $200,000 student loans and I know that's tough to deal with. But to the extent that you can financially work it out, uh, don't be discouraged by the current law job market. I think it's just a wonderful education and I would encourage people to, to go forward with it. Okay. We're coming to an end. Are there any closing comments or thoughts that you would like to record and, and, and save? Well, I, I think your questioning has so well directed it that there's really not a whole lot more I could say other than uh, I've really, really enjoyed my, my time in law, uh, enjoyed my time as a judge and a justice, and am enjoying what I'm doing now. And, and, and I treasure those many moments I have. And I know I shared that with my fellow colleagues here at the Court of Appeal at, at the time of my retirement. And uh, I truly love the people that work here, and I, I love my job. I didn't. Uh, retired because of dislike, but just to do something different. And uh, uh, I just uh, thank everyone who's been a part of uh, my my legal career because it's uh, been a reward to me. It's been an interesting one. Thank it's you. a privilege to have had the chance to, to sit you, down and I, I formally talk with you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.